complete. So thank you, Flora. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you all for being here remotely also. Um, do you hear me? Hear me fine? Yeah, yeah it's okay. If it's, it, also, if it, it's also very good for online participants. Okay, great. If there's a problem with that, don't hesitate to interrupt me because else it wouldn't really be good. So uh, the presentation I'm going to do today deals with this concept you probably all heard of, maybe all have an idea of what it is. And at the same time, it's a very complicated, complex, difficult concept. Why is that so? I'm going to give you a series of reasons why the complex is difficult to deal with and then try to show that something can be done with it. Um, first, there's a diversity of uses of this concept of populism. Oh. Okay, now I have an issue with remote control. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, why is it complex, complicated to talk about populism to do things with it? First, because there's a big diversity of uses in this concept. Many political actors are often qualified as populists. Of course, Donald Trump recently, but also his opponent, Bernie Sanders, who's on the other side of the political spectrum. If you look at international politics, many political leaders have been qualified as populists. Vladimir Putin, Viktor Orban, Boris Johnson, but also maybe more surprisingly, people such as Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada, who's a liberal, and in French politics, if we take a look at this specific country, people as Marine Le Pen, Éric Zemmour, or Jean-Luc Mélenchon are often qualified as populists. But also, and again, more surprisingly, even Macron sometimes is called a populist, which may sound a bit weird. If you look outside politics, Didier Raoult, the scientist, the scientist from Marseille, has been called a populist doing populist science, and even the Guide Michelin, has been qualified as populist. So there's a very big diversity of uses. And there's also an inflation of uses in uh, recent years. If you look at this Google Books and Gram Viewer, which <clears throat> recapitulates how much one word is used in the database of Google Books uh, along the history of, of what's included in that data database, you see that after 2010, more or less, there is a very sharp increase of the use of the words populism and populists. So there's something going on in recent years. If you look at the international literature more generally, you can see that there are around 37,000 references, by which I mean books, articles, papers, etc. 37,000 references which refer to populism in their title. This raises a series of issues. I'm going to try and sum up what's going on here by saying first that the problem with populism, with the concept of populism, is that not only it has a diversity of uses, but also a diversity of users. Politicians use the word basically as an insult, more or less a synonym of demagoguery. The media journalists use the concept very often to either put an order to the political space or simply to express a form of disdain towards the masses or to some aspects of democratic politics. Social science essays are also very um, keen on using the word populism. There has been, in recent years, a development of what has been called by Federico Tarragoni a populology, a populology that gives scientific legitimacy to the normative rejection of a series of parties political leaders, social movements, and so on and so forth. In this uh, sector of social science essayism, very often what is presented, defended, explained, is that is a horseshoe theory. The political space could be analyzed as a horseshoe in which the two extremes are very close to one another, okay? So the far left and the far right are very close according to this horseshoe theory, which you see illustrated in the drawing I am now displaying, which is a drawing by Sampé made in 2011, showing Marine Le Pen and Jean-Luc Mélenchon as basically having the same type of discourse. Okay, so with such a diversity of uses and the diversity of users, is this really a useful scientific concept? 
I am going to say that there is actual serious research on populism, or at least based on this concept, not only essays. There are numerous interesting works and they should be acknowledged. And I'm going to try and acknowledge them afterwards. But still, this research still has an issue with normativity on the one hand, and maybe above all, clarity. Clarity, why is that so? Because there are three types of issues, which I'm going to sum up by talking about chameleon populism first. Why chameleon? Because this concept has as many def definitions as there are users, if I ex exaggerate just a little bit. So research in this field is rarely cumulated. Very often people show up, I mean, scientists, essayists show up and say, oh, I have a definition of populism and what's been done before is not really interesting. I have the real definition. So here you have a chameleon concept because all these people have it, are having different definitions of the same concept. Then there's a Cinderella complex around populism. This Cinderella idea was first defended by Isaiah Berlin in 68 in an article called To Define Populism, where he basically said, we have a shoe. This shoe is called populism. And somewhere there is a princess who perfectly fits the shoe. We don't know where the princess is, but we know she exists. And one day we are going to find her. So we have a shoe and we don't really know what we're going to make it. So Cinderella complex, and also we could talk about populism as being involved in a sort of drunkard parable. The drunkard is looking for his keys under a street lamp, not because he lost his keys under the street lamp, but because there's light under the street lamp. So you could say light is what is the fame you can get by working on populism or simply the fact that there's so many uses of it that there, means, there must be something around that word that can explain uh, reality. We don't know that. We may be drunk a little bit doing this type of science. So still, what should be done with populism then if it's so complicated? I'm going to advance my claim and I don't think there's no need to prolong the suspense. I think that a modest alternative approach should not be based on a better or an ultimate definition of the term, but on the sociology at the actual uses of this concept. Here's my outline for today's presentation. I'm going to have four sections. I, fir I first, first I'm going to talk about a few main existing conceptions of populism in political science to give you like sort of idea of what's going on here in the debates in the discipline. Then I'm going to show that this can be con considered populism as an essentially contested concept. And I'll show that given the nature of this concept, what could be interesting is to develop an interpretive approach. I'm going to explain why, well, I mean, what, what the hell is this interpretive approach? And then show a, a part at least of my research agenda on the uses of, pop of populism. So I, now turn to my first section, main existing conceptions of populism in political science. I think today I'm going to talk about four main conceptions. Populism is often defined or considered as a type of organization, as a type of ideology, as a type of style, or as a type of political construction. Populism as a type of organization has been one of the definitions defended by Kurt Weyland in the early 2000s. He defines populism as a political strategy through which a personalistic leader seeks or exercises government power based on a direct, unmediated, uninstitutionalized support from large numbers of mostly unorganized followers. So his definition actually works with this table. Um, is there a later? Yeah. So populism is based on the idea that an individual person is leading through direct and unorganized relations to a support base. And populism is also based on one power capability, which is numbers. There must be crowds of people supporting the leader or else it's not populism. So populism has a somehow problematic relation to democracy. Populism is based on elections, okay? It's not based on military power, a dictatorship, a military dictatorship, according to this definition, would not be populist. Or uh, economic influence 
might not also be qualified as populist according to this definition. Still, there is a problem with this perspective. Why is that so? Because the definition of Whalen is often considered too narrow. Why is that? Because emblematic populist cases in history are, his are excluded from the definition. There are typical examples of populist movements, organizations, etc., that work without a leader. If you look at the first historical case of what is usually considered populism, there's the case of the Narodniki in Russia, which is an agrarian protest movement against Russian autocracy in the 19th century, around 1860. This movement had no specific leader. There was no personalized power mobilization around the Narodniki. There were leaders, of course. There was an elite of the Narodniki, but not a personal individual which will lead the masses. The same applies to the US People's Party, a political party that was created at the end of the 19th century to oppose the domination of the Democratic and Republican parties who were considered by this movement as mm, Washington elites disconnected from the reality of farmers from the Midwest defending their land, etc. So again, the US People's Party presented candidates in elections, but there was no charismatic leader which could be associated with the movement. And of course, my last example, and there's an image, is the example of the Yellow Vests movement, which is very often considered as populist because of the type of discourse that's mobilized. And the Yellow Vest movement is constructed around the idea of rejecting the, 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 the the appearance of a leader, okay? Whenever a leader starts appearing among the yellow vests, he tends or she tends to be rejected, okay? So there's a problem with the Wayland uh, definition. Another example is that there are very typical examples of populist governments in the 1940s and 1950s in Latin America, which means there is populism with strong organization. Uh, Juan Perón in Argentina created a government in the 40s Getulio Vargas in Brazil also are very often considered the typical examples of Latin American populism in history. And they, not only did they have political organizations to support them, but they were at the basis of a form of welfare state in Latin America. Okay, so the problem with the issue of leadership and the problem with the issue of organization. The second main definition conception of populism in political science considers it as an ideology. This is a trend that's organized around the leadership of a political scientist from the Netherlands, Cas Moeden, which defines, who defines populism as an ideology that considers society to be ultimately separated into two homogeneous and antagonistic groups, the pure people versus the corrupt elite, and which argues, this ideology argues that politics should be an expression of the volonté générale, the general will of the people. The opposition between people and elite here is very much based on the concept of morality, not on the concept of class. You're not defending the working class against the bourgeoisie or the nation against foreigners. It's a morality that is definitional for the pure people. It may be associated with notions of class or notions of nation, but still what defines populism is this concept of morality. In his work on the Gilets Jaunes, Samuel Hayat has shown that what they defended in their discourse was not necessarily a systematic criticism of capitalism, but the return to a moral economy of real people, okay? So here the morality is really apparent. The definition of Cas Mude has also this interesting thing that it's considered as an ideology, but as a thin ideology. Thin ideologies have a more limited ambition and scope than thick ideologies. Thick ideologies formulate what he calls a broad menu of solutions to major socio-political issues. So thin ideology is what characterizes populism and real life populism is usually associating this thin ideology with one or two more uh, broad ideologies, thick ideologies. So real life populism is generally associated, for instance, with socialism or with nationalism. Most populist movements or 
or mobilizations are social populism, national populism, etc. According to Kasmut, again, again, um, what's the problem again with this definition? It's often considered too inclusive in this case. Why is that so? Because anyone can be a populist. What's described here in the definition is a very standard pattern of political discourse. If you follow that definition, again, Macron could qual be qualified as populist. He defended a sort of pure people against the um, corrupt elite of politician that's been governing the country for years and years, the political parties that are only um, preoccupied by themselves and not by the real solutions, etc. So Macron's candidacy in 2016, 17, was partly structured around this idea of opposing a pure citizenship versus a corrupt political class. But the problem is that this applies to Macron, but it also may apply to Hitler. So a concept that applies to both Macron and Hitler might be a little problematic. A solution has been given to that in further research on, I mean, using an ideational approach to populism. Uh, for instance, Kirk Hawkins, who worked on Venezuela's Chavismo, Chavismo is the movement organized around President Hugo Chavez, um, and he built a sort of uh, populism scale, which enabled him to classify discourse according to the degree of populism that is being used. And this enabled him to show that Chavez had a very populist discourse, even if you compare him to other typical populist uh, examples, and you can have also a very low grade on the populism score and still be included in the framework while not being exactly populist. So this is a, a way to complexify the definition to make it more subtle. Third type of conception of populism in political science is to consider it as a style. Style is a very labile notion. It's very vague. It's very... Uh, elastic. So a lot of definitions of populism consider it as a style by, and mean different things with it. There's a very interesting model, which was proposed by Pierre Postigui, who's a political scientist from Canada working in Chile, where he defined with a very simple definition and a very sophisticated model, populism as the flaunting of the law against the high, the flaunting, the defense of the law against the high. So a very sophisticated model that I'm going to try and explain in a few minutes. I mean, in the few minutes that are starting now. So usually if you describe the political space politics, you explain the way actors position themselves on one dimension, which is the left right dimension, okay? This dimension has two axes. One axis is structured around a conflict about socioeconomics where you oppose one side that's favoring the redistribution of wealth versus another side that defends individual property rights. Okay, so this is one axis in the populist dimension, in the, sorry, in the left-right dimension. You have a second axis that's structured around uh, political cultural terms, where the conflict is over the, the strength, the necessary strength of authority. Authority meaning here the hierarchical relations of power and also the relation to traditional values. So on the left, you're going to have a criticism of hierarchy, of tradition. On the right, you're going to have more pro-authoritarian authoritarian stances and uh, stances defending traditional values and social relations. So this is the typical dimension by which we describe the political space. And Pierre Ostigui, in his model for understanding populism, say that, says that there's a second dimension, which is structured around the opposition between high and low. And this high and low opposition also has two axes. The first axis is uh, based on a sociocultural dimension or concern or conflict, okay? And it has two features. The second axis is based on political cultural issues. The sociocultural axis opposes first um, manners. You have well-behaved manners being polite, to say it very simply, which corresponds to the high position in this high-low distinction. And you have different types of manners, which are going to be more coarse, uninhibited, direct, maybe rude, 
which are going to correspond to the low position in the axis, okay? High-low distinction. This high-low distinction in sociocultural terms also is concerned with the, the debate over the importance we have to give to native traits. On the low side, you're going to emphasize the from here, the native dimension of your political discourse, your political personality. On the high side, you're going to emphasize cosmopolitanism, okay? So the sociocultural axis of the high-low opposition is based on these two aspects of social cultural um, conflicts. And there's a political cultural axis also, which opposes um, different forms of political leadership, more personalized on the low side and more formalized, more proceduralist on the high side, okay? So this is the second dimension that's presented by Ostigi to, to help us understand what populism is about. What's interesting, okay, so here you have a graphic presentation of the high-low dimension. What's interesting is that you can assemble the two dimensions, left, right, and high-low in a wheel of axis, which, okay, this is a bit scary. The idea is that, for instance, um, West European or US radical right populist parties or leaders are going to be in this sector. Why? Because they defend social order, they're on the political cultural right, they tend to defend sort of personal, personal, personalistic authorities, maybe macho type of discourse. He's, going, he's talking about ballsy discourse. Um, they're going to be located on the law in general, and they're going to defend also the social cultural law, uninhibited type of types of communication. So here you typically would found, uh, for instance, Donald Trump, but maybe also Nicolas Sarkozy, right? You have then also a social, I mean, um, a, high, a high right where you could find, I don't know, maybe Macron, maybe Angela Merkel, okay, examples like that. You'd have a high left, which would work with uh, maybe Olaf Scholz, uh, now prime minister in Germany, or Lionel Jospin, people like that. And on the low left side, you would typically find Hugo Chavez, uh, and maybe more contemporarily, you could discuss that Jean-Luc Mélenchon is here. Although actually Pierre Ostigui, I've heard him talk about Mélenchon and he's not sure that he's really there, right? So this is a way to organize political space that's proposed by Pierre Ostigui. I now go to the fourth type of conception of populism in political science, but I'm going to have a little war. The fourth conception is the one that's proposed by Ernesto Laclau, who's a political theorist originally from Argentina, but who actually worked in the United Kingdom for all his life and who passed away in 2014 or 15, I think. Uh, according to Laclau in his book on populist reason, published in 2005, which is a very, very complex theoretical model. I'm going to try and be simple about it. His definition is populism is quite simply a way of constructing the political. So the political, the populism is a form of logic, a form of construction of political discourse and identities. Um, this political logic appears when a dichotomized political space is created, an antagonist space of opposition between a we and a them. And what's interesting in Laclau's definition is that the we and the them can be filled with almost anything, right? So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try and give a step-by-step -step simple explanation of his theory. The idea is that in society in general, diverse demands coexist. A demand for democracy, a demand for women's rights, a demand for economic redistribution, and also demands for the recognition of social identities, such as the working class identity. In institutional settings where everything's going fine, the institutions are able to absorb or to respond to these demands individually, separately, okay? So you have a demand for women's rights, okay, the state responds. You have a demand for redistribution, okay, the state responds. But in cases of institutional crisis, the state is not able to respond to these diff different demands individually, separately. So there's a, an institutional crisis in which the populist logic of antagonism is going to appear. And what happens there is that all the demands are going to be united. Ten, there's, there's going to be a tendency to unite different demands 
around what Laclau calls the chain of equivalence. The different isolated demands create a unification, an emotional unification under a chain of equivalence that's going to articulate several demands to gain strength against the state, the, the state whom they're going to be opposed with. And here, when you have this chain of equivalence, Laclau considers that an empty signifier becomes necessary. What is an empty signifier? The empty signifier is one of the demands that's going to acquire a new status of uniting them all under its umbrella, okay? So typical examples of empty signifiers are the working class. In the history of socialism, the working class has been the empty signifier of different demands, not only the identity of the working class or economic redistribution, but also in some cases, political rights, etc. So here is the empty signifier that unites almost emotionally the chain of equivalence. So the, the empty signifier can be the working class, but it can be also in, all, in other cases, democracy. And it's very often a leader. In Laclau's theory, the leader, I mean, his, his theoretical elaboration is based on the case of Peronism in Argentina. And the typical leader that's an empty signifier is Juan Perón himself. himself. So you have this notion of empty signifier that's interesting in Laclau. And you have also the notion of floating signifiers. A floating signifier is typically a demand that's not necessarily attached to one chain of equivalence. And he's going to take the example of patriotism or nationalism. Nationalism, according to him, and here we could say that D1 is nationalism, could be included in a chain of equivalence of, for instance, the left. We could say that this is the left. But there can be a dispute, and there could be another chain of equivalence that would be maybe the right, which also wants to defend and include the demand for nationalism. Okay. And Laclau's purpose by saying that and by proposing this theory is to define and defend a new left strategy to seize power in neoliberal Europe, okay? By saying, okay, we have traditional chains of equivalence of the chains of equivalence of the left, which don't use all the potential that exists in society. And the left should include demands, for instance, for patriotism in order to be able to seize power in a new context. Um, so this case of conception of, of populism in political science has one very specific characteristic. It's the most famous example of a positive normative definition of populism. The populist reason or populist logic, according to Laclau, is actually the real democratic politics. This has to do with Laclau's youth activism for Juan Perón in Argentina, with his activism and support for left-leaning governments in Latin America, he was very close to Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, to Cristina Kirchner and Néstor Kirchner in Argentina. So here you have a normative position that's connected to actually a commitment as an intellectual, right? And his proposal was made even clearer um, by his wife, Chantal Mouffe, with whom he actually published books in the 80s and 90s, and who in 2016, after Laclau passed away, uh, published a book called very simply, for left populism, where she defended this theoretical model in order to propose a new strategy for the left in Europe to seize power. Okay, I, I now showed you a few conceptions that I consider the main conceptions of populism in political science. You've seen that there are similarities, there are differences, but there's still a problem. It's that there's no agreement on the overall terms of the subject. Plus, there are many more conceptions of populism existing. I didn't talk about any one of them, of course. And the popularity of these different conceptions doesn't really vary according to scientific uh, logics or reasons, but actually it has more to do with current political phenomenon, phenomena that can be explained by one or the other theory or simply by hypes, okay? There's been a populist hype recently structured around Chantal Mouffe and Laclau in the 10 past 10 recent years. So all this gives us a risk of cacophony, of lack of cumulativity of research on populism. And then we could say that this has to do very 
I mean, very essentially, with the idea that populism is an essentially contested concept and the specific form of essentially contested concept, as I'm going to defend in a few seconds. What is an essentially con contested concept, an ECC? They have been defined for the first time in 1956 by a philosopher called William Galley, and he defined essentially con contested concepts as concepts, the proper use of which inevitably involves endless disputes about their proper uses on the part of their users. So the idea is that these are concepts where there's no general method for deciding between rival definitions, rival hypotheses. It's not possible to have a knockout in these debates over what's the good definition. So we could say that if we compare this to scientific uh, theories or of more maybe hard science, there's no method to falsificate one hypothesis, one definition. There's never going to be a method for that, okay? So this is why we can call, we can talk about essentially contested concepts. And these types of concepts do not necessarily mean that people who use them are irrational. No, Galley actually says that you can trace the logic of an individual's use of one concept. What's interesting is that these ECCs are very much, I mean, you could say that these ECCs are everywhere in political science because political concepts are generally debated and maybe essentially contested concepts. Definitions of democracy, there's plenty of them. You could say that there are definitions that highlight the liberal aspect of democracy, representation, freedom of choice, but there are popular or um, egalitarian definitions of democracy that insist on participation, equality of social and political conditions, etc. So here you could say that there's a, a continuum of binary types of definitions. And there are different definitions, but they are placed on this political continuum. The same applies to definitions of, of uh, freedom. There are negative definitions of freedoms no interferences is freedom, but there's positive definitions of freedom. Freedom is the ability to collectively decide something, to collectively acquire power, etc. The same applies to totalitarianism and to many other political concepts. What's specific about populism is that, of course, this works, but it works even more in the case of this concept, and I, at least that's my point here. My point is to say that the concept of populism its uses, can, its uses can hardly be placed in a binary continuum of meaning. There's more than two, three, four dimensions. I could hardly classify the theories, the conceptions I just talked to you about on a political space that would be order. I could hardly make a definitive, a definitive classification of all these concepts. And if I tried to do so, someone might probably show up and say, no, 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 no this doesn't work. You're, you're, you're not right. And there would be a strong discussion. So. My point here is to say that probably um, populism is not, an essential, is not only an essentially contested concept, but it's maybe an essentially contested, essentially contested concept, okay? So it's a square essentially contested concept with the, this is why I put this formula here that I wouldn't be able to explain if I just showed up. Um, <clears throat> so then what should be done with populism? I think there are four options. And of course, the fourth option is going to be mine. And of course, it's the better. It's the best. So four options. First option, destroying the icon. There are too many possible definitions of this concept. It's not scientific. Then it should be abandoned simply. It doesn't explain things. This is a position that is very often defended by scholars working on the far right. We consider that talking about far right is very much precise, very more specific, more specific than talking about populism. A second option is to promote toleration. Okay, the concept of populism, whatever you think about it, is omnipresent, it's everywhere, and it should be dealt with. We need to analyze populism, even though we don't have a perfect definition. So this would be a second option that also exists in the literature, okay? A modus vivendi with the concept of populism. A third option would be to wait for the Messiah. In general, people defending such an option consider themselves as messiahs, okay? 
there's been no real serious work on populism. And I'm going to propose to you the real ultimate definition. Now shut up and listen to me, right? So these are Messiah types of proposals around surrounding populism. And there are many of those, I'm not going to give names, of course. Uh, and I think the fourth option is analyzing miracles. What do I mean by that? How come that something that does not mean anything turns out to mean something to some people? What do people mean to do when they talk about populism? So this is going to be my perspective, focusing on the uses of the concept, which is very much a sociology of ideas perspective and also a relativist perspective, okay, to some extent. What I defend here is that meaning of populism and in general meaning of concepts is always contextual. In different contexts, a concept is going to have different meaning for the people that use it. This is uh, related to uh, a school in the history of political thought that uh, has one inspiring figure, which is Quentin Skinner, um, which I, I, I develop on very much. So this means going towards an interpretive approach. What is an interpretive approach? What is it based on and what is it not doing? It's not doing normative research and it's not doing exactly analytical research either. Normative approaches would try to find solutions or cures to populism considered as a, a disease, a pathological phenomenon, phenomenon in democracies. Normative approaches would also reject or support populism as a possible strategy for political parties and movements. This is not what I'm going to do. Analytical approaches would consider that populism is a heuristic concept for understanding political dynamics. And it would try to find a right definition and work with that definition. As you understood, I'm not going to do that, or at least I'm trying not to do that. What I, what I try to do is an interpretive approach on which I'm going to focus on the actual uses of the concept to understand their meaning. The advantage of this is that we don't need a definition to get started. We do need to determine, we do not, sorry, mean, need to determine if populism is heuristic and we still have a viable scientific agenda. We're going to focus, assuming a sociological approach to ideas, and here I, I go to my research agenda. We're going to focus first on the role of the concept of populism in political parties' strategic discussions, its impact on the social construction of political cleavages. So that's the first direction. The second direction is to look at ordinary uses and understandings of the concept of populism among ordinary political actors. For instance, rank and file activists, okay? There are limited opportunities to do so. Why is that? Because few political actors explicitly revindicate a populist identity. There are two interesting cases in the recent history of political mobilizations in Europe. One uh, is located in Spain, it's the party, party Podemos, and another is located in France and it's called La France Insoumise. I'm going to work with those parties, on those parties with these two types of directions, research questions. And one transversal issue that is very important to me is the influence of Latin American politics on European understandings of populism. So populism and the partisan left. I'm going to work on two aspects. Which is the parallel and interconnected process by which the populist moment was perceived by a series of political actors in Spain and France. And then show that this concept raised a series of party controversies that show that the understandings of the concept are different in Spain and France in very different, I mean, in several aspects. So the populist hypothesis in, in Spain was raised with the creation of a new party in 2014, Podemos, which means we can. This party explicitly inspired in Laclos' theory of populism. In 2015, Pablo Iglesias, who's the main leader, who was the main leader of Podemos, published an article in the New Left Review where he explicitly revindicated populism as a positive strategy and a positive identity defended by his party. 
Inigo Errejón, which was number two in Podemos during several years, published a book with the, the Popus of Left Populism, which is Chantal Mouffe, Construir el Pueblo in 2015 also, building a people around the populist strategy. So <clears throat> explicit reivindications and uses of this concept of populism that were very much inspired by Latin American models. Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, Evo Morales in Bolivia, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, etc. These are the main references in general. <clears throat> also Argentina, to some, to, to some interesting extent. Their idea was that um, the 2008 economic, financial, political crisis had brought about a form of Latin Americanization of Southern Europe in terms of poverty, in terms of precariousness, in terms of instability, etc. And that in this context, it was a nice and interesting move to inspire on what had been going on in Latin America in the 90s, in the 2000s, to see what their governments, their left populist governments, had done in that situation. So their idea was to break with the European traditional left models to exploit the window of opportunity in which Southern Europe was very much looking like Latin America, which had very different traditions and uh, ideological models. This idea of Latin Americanizing European politics did not come out of nowhere. Um, a, a high proportion of Podemos founders, Podemos elite, had been a working um, or were members of a Spanish think tank that operated in Latin America in the 2000s. This think tank was called the Fundación Centro de Estudios Políticos y Sociales, the Center for Political and Social Studies. The CEPs missions were basically counseling left-wing governments and parties in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Paraguay, in Chile. Spanish people were sent there to work with the left-wing governments and took a few lessons from what they saw and from what they did. And the idea of Podemos founders who had been part of these people who had gone to Latin America was to apply what they had learned there to Spain. Um, so this is for the, the, the intellectual genealogy. Now, what is the, this popular strategy about? I'm going to try and show you quickly. Um, <clears throat> if you look at symbols, signs, words used, you're going to see an interesting change showing what it is about. Uh, first, the empty signifier of the left, the, the uniting concept, the uniting uh, emotion or, or imagi imaginary, imaginary, yes, uh, used to be for the left, the working class, not exactly the people. Podemos is going to put forward this concept of people, el pueblo, la gente. Um, then Podemos is going to try and hegemonize a series of floating signifiers that were usually associated with the right, concepts that were usually appropriated by the right, but that the left could use also to enlarge its public, its voters, okay? Two concepts, for instance, the family or the fatherland, the, pay, the la patria. The family, how can you have a left-wing poster on family? Well, by defending same-sex families is defending the value of family. By preventing home evictions, you're protecting families who are not expelled from their home and sleeping in the streets. That's one way to put it. How do you defend the fatherland, the homeland, la patria, in a left type of way? By building a progressive patriotism, okay? That's going to be like something under, under the, the radars of political discourse along Podemos' creation. Then you have colors and symbols. Um, the, the use of colors by Podemos is very much linked to the use of the color purple. So they're not using red, which is associated with the traditional left, they're using purple. Signs, they're not using the raised fist, which is typical of the left again, they're using the V sign, which has something to do with uh, particularly Argentine Peronism. This sign is typically Peronist, okay? So changing the symbols, the colors, the signifiers of the left is the, the populist strategy um, defended by Podemos at the time. Also accepting the personalization of politics and exploiting it. Podemos had this leader, Pablo Iglesias, whose physical appearance 
was used as a tool for propaganda, okay? He was very famous because he had participated in many broadcasts in television, and they used his face, his face on ballot papers, which was something new in Spain, okay? When you voted for Podemos, you had the face of Pablo Iglesias on your ballot, which they considered something taboo for the left, which according to them was opposed to this personalization of politics because what they defend is programs, ideas, etc. That's according to them, I'm talking about uses of the concept. Um, <clears throat> if you look at France now, you can see that a similar process has been going on since 2010, 2011, 2012. If you look at Jean-Luc Mélenchon's trajectory, because we are actually talking about him and his friends and his movements, um, you see that Mélenchon, when he, he quit the Socialist Party in 2009, he created another party called the Parti de Gauche, the Left Party. The strategy at that time was to defend a true left, okay? Coming back to the roots of the real left. And then there was a slow change and a switch in 2016. The Parti de Gauche, the Left Party was more or less abandoned and a new structure was created, La France Insoumise. In La France Insoumise, in the name, you don't have left, you have La France. So we, they, 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 they resigned the left label to talk about, to put forward national identity and some sort also of nationalism, which was something a bit new in the context. If you look at Jean-Luc Mélenchon's books, the titles, you see that in 2009, he was talking about L'autre gauche, the other left. In 2011, he published a book which is an explicit reference to two slogans of Latin American political movements of the 2000s. Aitus, let them all go away, is a slogan from Argentine movements of 2001 against the political class. La Révolution Citoyenne, the citizen revolution, is the concept that was uh, defended by President Rafael Correa in Ecuador during his government. The ties of Mélenchon with Rafael Correa are often publicized. So there's an explicit um, defense and inspiration in Latin American models by Mélenchon and his environment. Another similar aspect in the French popular strategy is the <clears throat> comparable relation to the founding mother of left populism, Chantal Mouffe. Chantal Mouffe during the campaign in 2016, 2017 was very often invited to rallies, to meetings, etc. And well, of course that picture shows that these guys love each other very much. So <clears throat> at least that's the, the, the image that's being shown, okay? So you have a connection to Latin America, a connection to the theorists of left populism and an evolution of the discourse, the names, the symbols that are mobilized. Um, I go a bit more quickly to, again, symbols. Here are the posters from the 2012 campaign, the left front, red colors on the poster. Here's a picture from the 2017 campaign. There, you don't have the left anymore. You have the people, the people, and the poster is blue. In 2022, you have a mix of the two blue and red. So I don't know what exactly this means for the near future, but it means, I think, something. Um, it shows that the use of this strategy is not stable. It's something that's always, always fluctuating. It might be abandoned, it might be transformed, it might be understanded a different way a long time. And this leads us to talk about the comparison of party controversies over populism in France and in Spain. In Spain, <clears throat> there, there started to have a dispute around this idea of populism around two years after, after the creation of the party. In 2016, uh, there was a, a union that was created between Podemos and basically the Spanish Communist Party. This coalition was called, is called today Unidas Podemos, uh, Together We Can. And in the, the logo of the, the, the coalition, you have the purple and the red, which shows that there's sort of mixing that's going on here, at least in the symbol dimension. And this coalition led to internal disputes within Podemos. Errejón, which I told you before was number two, this is Iglesias, number one. Errejón was not happy at all about this depopulisticization of Podemos. He was the, the main defender of the populist strategy within the party. And also after 2016, there started to have disputes within the party around the people defending the populist strategy, those who defended a more traditional left identity. 
And in 2019, Errejón left Podemos and created a new, much smaller structure, Más País, which means more country, <clears throat> which led to, well, the idea was to main, maintain the populist narrative, but at the same time, giving it a new, a new form, a new style, okay? So Errejón is now wearing a jacket, he's still wearing, doing the V sign, but the colors are interesting here because Mas País, here the, the, the slogan is join the green wave. So populism is redefined by Errejón and his team as with a new empty signifier. It's not the people as such anymore. The new empty signifier is the environment, ecology, okay? So here in Spain, you have a tendency to have a, a very, a very open populism, I'd say, very inspired by new social movements in connection with environmental issues. Um, if you look at disputes in France within La France Insoumise over populism, you see that populism acquires a very different meaning over time. After the presidential election of 2017, there started to have disputes within La France Insoumise over immigration issues, over the European Union, and uh, over laicity. Supporters of left populism in the, the, the environment of Mélenchon, where in these disputes were usually opposed to multiculturalists within the party. Okay, so you had an opposition of left populists with multiculturalists. Left populists were defending a more nationalist stance, actually. People like George Kuzmanovich here wanted to have more, uh, more authoritarian, more firm positions in connection to the issue of immigration for instance. He left La France Insoumise in 2019 and created a new very small structure called République Souveraine, so insisting on sovereignty versus the European Union and uh, promoting a sort of union of the different sovereignists, uh, people who wanted to continue Jean Jaurès's work, a socialist, and Charles de Gaulle's work, a right-wing leader. So you have this trend other people who were members of La France Insoumise and quite close to Mélenchon also joined Arnaud Montebourg's campaign uh, for these elections. And Arnaud Montebourg is actually taking or advocating a form of left-wing nationalism and tries to occupy the cultural space of the right in some aspects, okay? So here in France, I mean, a short conclusion on these party controversies is that in Spain, the, the, the meaning of populism evolved from the, the defense of precarious youth to maybe ecology, while in France, populism took a more conservative stance on, for instance, nationalism and immigration issues. So the meaning of populism for the left depends on the context. This is what I want to highlight as a partial conclusion. I go now to my last section, <clears throat> which uh, deals with populism and rank and file activism. Why is that interesting? I think it is, because the uses of the concept of populism are rarely analyzed from below. We're always talking about intellectuals, about journalists, about public leaders, political elites, as I just did. But what about average political actors, such as rank and file activists of, for instance, Podemos and La France Insoumise? This leads us to two types of research questions. I'm going to treat only the first one today, uh, because it's the one I've been able to work on um, up until now. First question is, what drives you to support the concept of populism? And here I'm going to show a few preliminary results. Another research question is, what are the meanings attached to the concept of populism among rank and file activists? And are they the same that we have seen in the political elites? Is it different or not? Okay, so regarding my first research question here, what's my research protocol? The idea is to taste, to test a series of common assumptions on support for the populist strategy among the left. Usually we say that populism is built on a rejection of the left-right division, saying, okay, the left-right doesn't mean anything anymore. We need to be populists to really talk to people. So if we follow this assumption, we should find that if we ask the question to activists, their position on the left-right scale should not be relevant to understand their support for this idea of populism. A second assumption is that populism is a vehicle for new activist generations tired of traditional parties. So here, age and militant experience should have a negative effect. 
the older you are, the more experienced you are, the less attracted you are to this idea of populism and the other way around, of course. And the third assumption is that populism is inspired by Latin American political experiments. And here, activists interested in Latin American politics should have a more favorable stance towards populism than the others. So I tested this by um, conducting a survey among Podemos and La France Insoumise activists in the spring of 2020. I'm not going to give details on the survey and the methods today. If I mean now, we can, we can discuss it in, in the discussion if you want. But <clears throat> I'm going to show a few preliminary results. The first result is descriptive. I asked people, I mean respondents, what do you think of the concept of populism? And what do you think of the concept of left populism? Do you like it or not? They had to grade these concepts. And I reorganized, I reclassified their responses uh, as I dislike populism, I'm neutral towards it, I like it, and I don't know, okay? <clears throat> we see that in both cases, populism and left populism, I know, that's not what I mean to say. In both cases, left populism, in both cases, Podemos and La France Insoumise, we see that a majority of supporters among those who have a clear opinion, a majority of them supports the idea of left populism. This is very much pronounced in La France Insoumise. It is less pronounced among Podemos activists, but still the liking people are a majority among uh, in, inside the, 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 the database. This is not the case for populism where we have opposing trends. Um, as regards populism, we have a majority, a relative majority of supporters among La France Insoumise activists, while it's the other way around with for Podemos, okay? So the tendency is different if we look at the concept of populism, which I am going to focus now to give uh, not descriptive results, but regression results. So <clears throat> to very quickly present regression to people who are not familiar with it, the idea here with this, types of, this type of table is to analyze the effect of different variables, these are the variables, okay? Gender, age, education, the effect of different variables on support for the concept of populism. And what's interesting with regression is that you can control the effect of other variables, such as, for instance, you can disconnect the effect of education and the effect of age. Very often people younger are, uh, have more education. So how, how do you make a distinction between the two effects of these variables? With a regression, you can, you can make the difference. So here in this table, significant results are shown with little stars in the table, okay? When you have three stars, this is very significant. When you have one star, well, we don't have one star. We have two, it's significant. When you have one, it's slightly significant. When you have no star, the result is not really significant. So, <clears throat> What we see if we go back to my previous assumptions is that if you look at the left-right scale, the more right you are on the scale doesn't really have a significant effect on support for populism, which is the starting assumption, okay? So we confirm something here. We see a small positive effect of prior activism, but only for Podemos activists. So people who had in activists before joining Podemos tend to be more supportive of populism, but only slightly. The numbers are not very high here. For La France Insoumise, it doesn't work. You also see, and this is maybe more flagrant and more interesting, that people who consider that they are more inspired, the question I asked was, do you feel more inspired by Latin American politics than by other regions' politics? People who said yes tend to be more supportive of populism. And here you have significant results in both cases that go the same direction, okay? And the last assumption was about age. My idea was that age should have a negative effect on support for populism. And this is confirmed for Podemos and for La France Insoumise. So my starting assumptions are all partially confirmed, except for this aspect of assumption two, the effect of militant experience, which should uh, be further explored. Anyway, all this should be further explored in any cases because statistical methods for this type of research are kind of limited. They must be compensated by conducting qualitative research, conducting interviews, observations, etc. Why is that so? Because doing an in-depth conceptual analysis of the meanings conveyed by a concept is difficult with these types of statistical methods. 
Plus, there are issues with the representativeness of the sample I used. It's very difficult to get a representative sample when you are conducting surveys among political activists. So these results are, I'd say, preliminary and should be confirmed by further interviews afterwards. Um, so now I turn to my final conclusion, which is to say that I have tried to show you the interest of understanding populism through an interpretive sociology of ideas, which means asking the question, what do people do with populism? What is the meaning they attach to the concept? What do they aim to do when they use the concept? And what are the drivers? What leads them to do so? And this, I think, I mean, answering those questions must be based on a mixed methods research agenda, based on the study of texts, based on qualitative methods, and also on statistical methods. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David.